that I wanted to address before we moved on. Mm -hmm. um, any clarifications, especially, of anything? Well, not really on what we talked about, I think, but like, I've been trying in the mornings, like, I know I was dreaming, yes. but I, I just can't retrieve it. The, you were saying, like, to remember, try to, like, recall what you were dreaming about. Yes. And I'm in no, for some reason, at that point, like, there's no way to get to that. Here, have another chair. Over there, we're next to him. But you can't re recall them? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm trying, and I'm trying, and, and I know that sometimes at another yeah. part in the day, like, yeah. it'll come back to me, but at that moment in the morning, like, it's just like, I can't. It's just, I'm not, I don't know. Well, it really depends on what wakes you up, too. Yeah, if it's a baby. small child, yeah. wakes you up and grabs your attention. Because the ideal for, yeah. for dream recollection is to not jump out of bed, to not have an <laughs> alarm clock that makes you go like that, where you immediately turn your focus onto the day. Yeah. Um, once you've turned your focus, you've turned your focus. There's right. that drawing we had at the end last time of, of um, I had a drawing, let me get some pencils here, there, okay, this drawing I had like of us and, and it's like, kind of like, actually I put a circle but I'm going to put a little stick figure here, a great thing, and so, you know, and if this is the inner life and the self, when you're dreaming you're focused inward. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you're focused into the outer world. And so it's, you've changed your focus. And it's kind of nice to stay halfway between as you're waking up. And that way you don't, all of a sudden you become kind of the intermediary between the inner and the outer world. But most of us wake up with an alarm clock or we wake up and immediately the inner is gone. We're focused. What am I going to do today? I got to get up. What time is it? You know, all the stuff of the day is going to happen so that, so your, your consciousness, and if you just think of this as consciousness, you're looking consciously through the dream into the inner world at night. Your external consciousness has basically gone to sleep. And now you're looking at the inner world. Um, so what you want to do when you wake up is attempt to stay focused in there for a while. And you're in that kind of in-between state. And just get what you can. You go, what was that? It was a rock. It's a rock. And then all of a sudden, just the rock starts to open up to different things. You know, all of a sudden start going, or I was running away. And then it's like, oh yeah, them. And as you start to tell your dream, and that's why it's sometimes nice to write them down, as you start to write them down or tell them, more starts to come. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, oh yeah, and then there was, oh yeah, and, and it's like, you're actually refocusing back in, and in that refocus, you're gaining more and more what was going on. But if you focus immediately on the outside, everything's gone. It's like that's when people say, "I don't dream." It's really I just don't recall them because I'm immediately focused on this other side of life. You know, as I called it with the house, I'm focused on the outside, out of the front door, out of rather than out into the backyard. Um, so I find I know that I dream. But they're so chaotic that uh, it's very difficult for me to pull it together in the morning when I wake up. Mm -hmm. um, but I can recognize a general theme through most of it, most of the time when I'm, I'm dreaming. It's well, being that's... lost or a chase or being in one place after another and getting mm -hmm. there in strange ways. And they can be all over the world. Yeah. Um, well, we'll get to that's that's good it's because sort that's of an unknown. That that sense of how to deal with the dreams is going to be what we're really talking mm -hmm. about as we use it as bouncing back and forth between the Book of Revelation and this. I mean, how to actually get hold of the gobbledygook because you're not going to get much more chaotic and and kind of often not really very coherent as a lot of the Book of Revelation, mm -hmm. which is why so often when I've taught it. Usually say I get to the chapter thirteen and go I have absolutely no idea what's going on, <laughs> you know. So I, I am now totally and utterly lost, trying to make a complete rational, you know, progression of it, uh, rather than treat it as dreams or as the gobbledygook. But it's only gobbledygook because we're trying to actually recognize it once again from our little brain, 
of what I've already collected. And realizing, once I'm more go, go with our thing, if, make the head there, that everything is already in my head that I understand, then I can't understand all this other stuff that's out here in the, uh, any more than I can understand a lot of the universe. You know, I can look out there and I, you know, I could say that white dot in the sky is a white dot, a pinprick in the solid heaven and the, where the lights of heaven filter through. That was one of the old ideas, mm -hmm. is that what are those things you see them at night, but that since the firmament is absolutely solid, then you've got pinpricks in it. And we can see barely into the heavens where the lights are coming from, and that type of thing. So I can go, okay, I have no idea. Or now I can say, they're large balls of gas. That's but Venus. It, yeah, and then I go, and I still don't know what I'm talking about. Because, I mean, really, I mean, I just now call there. it's like people used to say, you know, the atom. You know, they think the atom is that, you know, that little thing that has a nucleus and all these things circle around. You know, no, that's not an atom. I mean, that's just a, that's a myth. I mean, the, the, good, the best myth, when I talk about myth, I'm talking about, like, the myth of an atom. We go, well, no, they're real atoms. Yeah, yeah. they are. But the myth is my story I tell in order to build it up. It's as if. Because, yes. I mean, all those little circles, which I've draw, draw, drawn very badly there, but if I try to do it a little better with things like this, I'm saying those are the orbits of the electrons. Now, any physicist will tell you you have no idea what the electron is. It's their energy it's a cloud. pattern. Energy patterns well, going that's, around in it. See, and then we say, what do I mean by energy? Yeah. And what I've, See, all of this is, what can I actually get? And one of the problems with us, and what Scripture is often doing, and what the book of Revelation we're saying is certainly doing is, is it's basically making us move beyond our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. There's a thing that is called, um, um, uh, gosh, I just forgot what I was saying. But it's uh, that sense of where, where everything I know is basically filtered through what I know. Mm -hmm. uh, confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. That's the word. <clears throat> Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means I see what it's going to confirm my already present belief. Mm -hmm. So, rather than s looking then, at it as starting off with what I know and I, I will stand to be corrected yes. wherever. Yes, that's that's the sense. So we basically think through confirmation <coughs> bias. Well, find is like confirmation bias is I already know all this stuff. And I just need to figure it out. So I wake up, I go, well, of course the dream meant this, because I, of course, it was the TV I show I watched last night, and therefore it's about the TV show, because I know the TV show, and it fits in then, rather than, like a good example of a dream, when do you think confirmation bias is? Well, I was the person had this, you know, I'm just at work, and I was at work, and it was like, just a work dream. I guess I'm stressing about work. Tell me more about the work. Blah blah blah. I mean, all these things. You know, it's like, and then it was like. Something came out which was, it was 3 in the morning. Wait a minute, 3 in the morning. Are you usually at work and all the people are at work at 3 in the morning? Oh, well, no. So this isn't about work. This is something that work's representing because it's not just a typical video replay mm -hmm. of the day. But we would say it. So it's like, and often we just remember what is also already going to be familiar to us. And then we dump everything else. And so, and what we're getting at, too, with the book of Revelation is most people have interpreted it according to what's already familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we get that sense. Rather than saying, I'm, uh, what I put, you know, a number of times last week, in this ocean of the true self, I am a little minnow. And my little minnow doesn't have all that much knowledge. It gets more. From, it starts to grow with knowledge. But if I say everything has to fit into my little minnow brain and conform to it, which is what we do in our, in our What's arrogance. What's a minnow? What's the minnow? What's a minnow, yeah. Uh, what is a minnow? Yeah. It's a little teeny fish about that big. Oh, okay. You see them in, yeah. in aqua freshwater aquariums yeah. often. They're the little ones. They're, they're, you see a lot of them because they're cheap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, things like that. But they're small fish um, and stuff. So, um, so in that sense, that's what we're going to say is it's gobbledygook only because I've not learned the language yet. Mm -hmm. Which is why we actually humble ourselves. There's just humility is the first virtue we need in order to deal with this. 
Mm -hmm. um, or you can put it this way, unless you die to your thoughts, you'll never get them. Mm -hmm. Or you die to yourself. Those who will save their lives will lose them. Mm -hmm. and in other words, I'm just going to be a minnow the rest of the world, life. And those who will lose their lives for the whole sake, for the kingdom's sake, mm -hmm. will find life. And so it is that humility of going, this is beyond me. And that's what we're getting at tonight. Because that's a good segue. Mm -hmm. We'll continue this because we're going to be moving. I'm going to go back one paragraph, but we're on page four. Um, and so right in the middle of page four, I'll continue reading. We've had John um, right now in our psychotherapy office with his really bizarre dream that is disturbing him. John goes on to relate the story of how he received specific insights for each of these churches. After this, he realized that it was as if he had previously been in an anteroom of the third heaven. For now he sees a door above him, and he is called up into a higher or deeper aspect of heaven. This is, we started off with going, remember, he's all of a sudden, you know, on Patmos on a Sunday morning, and all of a sudden he, he goes into a vision, and, and he's in the spirit. And in that vision he has behind him the Son of Man, standing amongst the seven candlesticks, holding seven stars in his hand. Mm -hmm. This is the vision. And he says, you know, to John, write down now what you're going to see. And then the, the angel starts to tell John all these things about you know, churches. He says, write a letter to this church and that mm -hmm. church and this church. So this is where that vision has been. But now, he says, wait a minute, it's almost as if I say, say in that one, there was an anti-room. Anti-room. It's like an outer room he's been in because he's about to go deeper. Because it's as if he sees a trap door in heaven. There he witnesses the heavenly liturgy before the magnificent throne of God. He tells of watching living creatures and angels as they call forth and produce terrifying events on the earth. This relating of horror upon horror continues building to a crescendo with the scene of final judgment and the end of the world as he knows it. Then, as we are almost out of breath from this climax, we sigh with awe and relief as we encounter the resolution as the new heaven and the new earth of beautiful heavenly city are presented and all ends well. <laughs> That's his dream. That's what we call the book of Revelation, his vision. Now, we need to make sense of all this material. Now many of you as we may have had apocalyptic dreams. When they're personal, they usually mean much like we're talking about, which is something major in life is about to change and happen. Mm -hmm. So when you have dreams of disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, things of this nature, often it's saying your life is about to be shaken up totally. We'll call it an apocalyptic dream, which is something is about to be revealed that's new um, and the like. Now, John's dream we take as not personal alone, that something big is about to change, but it's about to big change for the world, you know, this things because of all this stuff that's happening, and it does. It ends with a brand new world. The first step in any dream interpretation is to set aside preconceptions. That's what we we're just talking about. To interpret a dream, one must commence with the realization, "I have no idea what any of this means." And if we're all honest with ourselves, this should be an easy task with the book of Revelation. Hmm. However, in other situations, we often proceed as if we know what is going on. And this is a disastrous mistake. Dreams and visions come to us to shake up and to enlarge our present conscious positions. To impose the present conscious position on the dream is to negate its very purpose. John did not have this vision because he already knew what was to happen, but rather because he did not know. Too often the book of Revelation is taken as a document where John is seemingly is seeming to put into code language a conscious communication of the problems to come, as if hiding it from the uninitiated. 
However, this calls his description as a vision a lie. In that case, it is not a vision, but merely a coded language of a consciously produced story. You see the, the, the importance, I mean, th th those should realize how often we've taken it as such. Mm -hmm. It's as if John knew all this stuff and had to hide it, <laughs> as if he's hiding it from Caesar or somebody. You know, he's hiding it from people, and then everybody's got to figure it out. That's the difference between code and vision. A code is that. If you're World War II and didn't have the, you know, the Nazis had the uh, thing called the Enigma machine, where the, um, they put all their codes. So they had, say, okay, we're going to have a message that says, attack over here. They put it into the code, they send it out, and then the person with the machine can put the, the, the letter in the thing and put the letters in, and all of a sudden they get, and now it retranslates it. That's code. I know it. I'm going to hide it, except for the people that I want to see it. I've got it now. And that's, that's what we say is a code. That's how we treat the book of Revelation so often. John knew it. It's going to hide it from people. Then everybody in the church and all, from, for 2,000 years has to work to figure it out. Um, or we take it as not a code, but a dream. And a dream wants to get across to you its message. That's one thing it wants to do. Um, in that case, it's not a vision, but merely code of language. Or, to take the book Revelation and read it in the more Freudian manner, where dreams are seen as attempting to hide from the ego their very meaning. In a caricature of that approach, every long object would then be seen as phallic, a phallic symbol representing a repressed sexuality. Yet, yet why would we approach a dream, especially John's dream, in such a manner? Would we really assume that Jesus is coming to deliver a message to John, only then to hide that very meaning from him in the most obscure manner? To think in such a way appears rather convoluted and unnecessary. Instead, the dream is attempting to get a message across to the dreamer in as accurate a manner as possible. <clears throat> Good so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. I often think of dreams as a game of charades. The dream presents images and events in the manner of saying, it is as if. And then it delivers the message. Because of this, it is important for us to not assume that each image and event has a predetermined meaning that we know. And it is for this reason that dream dictionaries are, if not useless, at least of minimal use. Mm. What we need to understand is what each image and event means to John. Mm -hmm. Even when the image or event has a seemingly general and or common mythological theme, John's understanding and associations with these, are, these very images and events is of primary importance. It is John's dream, not mine. And it is with John that the game of charades is being played. Not, not to be contrary, but isn't it Jesus' dream given to John? It's, not, well, it's, John's, it's Jesus' message oh, okay. that's being given to John in a dream. Hmm, so, one. yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and in, and in a kind of a broad sense, we'd say that Jesus probably never needed to dream after, after, the, after the resurrection because he's complete consciousness. Mm -hmm. He's completely mm -hmm. conscious. Dreams come right. to us when we're unconscious, mm -hmm. bringing a message to try and enlarge us, to mm -hmm. help us grow mm -hmm. in that sense. So, so through the dream, John's dream, Jesus is bringing the message of change here. Um, and and uh, um, again, this again and repeat it, but it's saying it's John's dream. So often, what we'll do with somebody else that you will say, well, they'll tell us their uh, their dream, and we'll immediately go, well, I think that that means is because it means that to you, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and so it, it means something totally different to somebody else, um, and so you start on that personal level. What does it mean to you? Before we move into some general level, which is why dream dictionaries are, are not useless because you get the most broad spectrum thing. 
but they're not like, you know, um, almost, you know, cookbooks, <coughs> you know, something. This mm -hmm. equals that. So they often do say things like, this equals that. And so if you ever dream of water, it equals this. And it's like, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We'll all have different, different initial, you know, um, senses of things. So we'll look at these more as we come along. Or if you have an example you wanted me to speak to now, I would. But, um, but, the, but that sense, so we'll see, and I think I'll repeat this, but, um, but that we always start with the personal level of a dream and then move to the general. So, so even if I dream, dreamt of, um, of Artemis, and say, you say, you dreamt of Artemis. And I'd go, well, what is Artemis? So now I'd go, well, Artemis, you know, obviously you dreamt of Artemis, and therefore you're dreaming of, of a very powerful woman that the feminine is very powerful. It's like, no, Artemis was the name of a ship. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, tell me more about Artemis. You know, that type of a thing. We don't know what person meant by Artemis at that mm -hmm. point. We, that's when we put our own stuff into it too often. Um, and, it's, and, and as we're going through the book of Revelation or the whole Bible, one of the big problems is, is we read our present day into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, True. you know, rather than what did it mean to them then? first. Mm -hmm. And then you get deeper. There is a thing called, I'm not going to write it down, but the sensus plenor in Latin. The deep sense, basically. The, 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 um, and the sensus plenor is always that deeper level. So you ask, what does the person mean first, and what they mean, and what maybe God meant even on a deeper level? The great example of that one is out of Isaiah. And a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Mm -hmm. Isaiah almost, almost certainly, as the Jews understand it, is that's Hezekiah. The mm -hmm. next really important king would be the most godly king that Israel knew was about to be born, Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and that was the prophecy of Hezekiah. Ah, but then the spirit people knew and they took it to the deepest meaning. Yes, that's one meaning the personal meaning for that people at that time. But what's the general meaning for all time? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us, or Jesus. And so we get a, that deeper meaning from the personal. So we, we work these levels at times to get to understand things in dreams, rather than the most general or just the personal. Um, you have to kind of bounce back and forth. So in John's dream, it's John's dream, not mine. It is with John that the game of charades is being played. Next, we want to understand where the dream is pointing. When we looked at King Lear, it was observed that when we finally understood the end, we can incorporate the action into a meaningful whole. It will be the same in the interpretation or in the interpreting of the book of Revelation. When we comprehend the meaning toward which it points, we will be better able to gain a coherent understanding of the process represented in the symbols and images of the seals, the trumpets, the bowls of wrath, and so on. Understanding the end in order to grasp the process is of utmost importance in our interpretation. It's similar to reading the last chapter of a murder mystery and discovering the murderer prior to the reading of the rest of the book. In this sense, as we're talking about it, that's one reason why in dreams, at the end, when you wake up, go, where did it end? Asking yourself, how did it end? Rather than, oh, there was this dream, and it was like, okay, you know, then usually the climax gra grabs us, where all the energy, but how did it end? Where was the ending? Because that's usually where it was pointing to. What was the feeling at the end? What was going on? Getting the end that will help you understand the rest of the dream rather than just trying to pick out little pieces uh, of it. It's very much like, again, we do this with Bible study. If all you do is pick out one verse, you don't understand it. It's called mm -hmm. proof texting. Mm -hmm. You know, you need the whole context. And you actually need to know where it's pointing. Mm -hmm. um, then you can understand maybe what's being said. Um, did anybody see the sixth sense? Where I was, yeah, okay, good, good, good. So I'm not ruining it. I was told once that I was, you know, I should have put a put a spoiler alert in here. <laughs> so, uh, but anyhow, um, 
Or it is like being told that the protagonist in the film, The Sixth Sense, was a ghost prior to watching the film. Mm -hmm. If you remember it, how much that would that be helpful mm -hmm. if you saw that and went, oh, 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 you get the whole film at that point. You understand it all because and things like this because you didn't get it up to that point um, and stuff. So Some may call this unfair, reading or knowing the end prior to experiencing the beginning. It does remove the excitement of our story. However, we are not approaching the book of Revelation as an exciting mystery. We want to know what it means. To know the who in the who done it, or the fact that the character in the sixth sense was a ghost, allows us to understand the events in the preceding portions of the story in a more coherent, even if less exciting manner. Understanding the interpretation of the meaning in this book is complicated by the fact that many of us live in a confused state because we do not live by a coherent philosophy of life. We declare that we are headed for heaven, or at least we are we're, or at least hopeful that that is the direction we're going. And that is what guides our way in life. However, we otherwise act as if we are determined by our past. Mm. Our confusion arises because these two philosophies dominate our lives, yet they contradict each other. The Christian view has always been defined by the prospective, teleological, or finality view of life. In that case, life is determined by the future destiny of the individual. We see this in as simple and yet complex an example as the acorn. The acorn is only an acorn because within it is the potential reality of an oak tree which will one day become manifest. The acorn is not defined or guided by some push from behind but by a destiny it is to fulfill in the future. Do I need to chew on that for a minute or you got, if that's good? Okay, because we don't live by that. That's not our society. Mm -hmm. Our intellectual infatuation with classical Darwinism, Dar with classical Darwinian thinking, has us believing that everything is determined by past events, mm -hmm. in which case we are determined by past fate rather than destiny. Mm -hmm. That is, I say we're determined. This, now you see, was the huge argument and the problem where psychology was born. Primarily, so much of it was born out of Freud in the late 19th century. And Freud was a classical Darwinian mm. and, saw, and saw the soul as evolving, in this sense, in the same way as we would see classical Darwinian evolution. And because of that, everything is determined. So what your parents did to you, you're stuck. About five years, you're, you're determined. And people even say it, you know, well, it's my, it's my fate now. This is what's happened to me when I was young, and I can't escape it. And that's the way it is. Um, you know, this is who I'm going to be. I mean, that was Freud, that type of thing. Um, and so we have that determined in the psychological world. We have social Darwinism now, too, which is all of our society is determined in this kind of form that is what's pushing us, has created who we are in these different ways. So this whole concept is we're driven from behind rather than pulled from ahead. And that's, that's going to be the difference. Um, there is, um, you know, the, the, even the imagery, and this is where imagery again comes in, it's so important. If you're an agricultural person and new sheep, you know that shepherds don't drive the sheep. That's in the Old West. Cowboys had, you know, cattle drives, but you don't never drove the sheep, you drive cattle. Shepherds, what do they do? They walk before the sheep mm. with their crook. It's even why the, the church or throughout all times, you know, in that ancient time, the liturgy of the church, mm -hmm. up until recently, up until about the last 40 years, 50 years, the celebrant of communion always faced east. Mm -hmm. All, you know, and the altars of all churches are east, and churches were always built west to east. 
So you'll always find them like that. You come in the western door, and the, because everybody prayed to the east. Unlike, you know, Islam, which prays to Mecca. So if you're in India, you'll pray west. It's over here you pray to the east, you know, that you'll go east to Mecca or west to Mecca. Mm -hmm. You know, Christians prayed to the east, and on the old walls would be a red cross often showing you which is the east wall when you prayed. Mm -hmm. And that was because the Lord is coming again from the east. Mm -hmm. You'll be like lightning from the east to the west. Mm -hmm. So you pray to the east at all times. <laughs> and so where does the priest stand? The priest always stood facing east at the altar and the congregation coming behind because the priest was the shepherd mm -hmm. the sheep were following. Mm -hmm. This symbolism has always been there of we follow, we're not driven, we are drawn by God. Mm -hmm. We're not driven by God, we're led by God. And, um, and I always love it, there was an old joke that Bishop Schofield used to tell when he was, before he became a bishop that because he had actually taken a group from St. Columbus um, to, um, to Israel. And they got off and they got on the bus and they were driving along and they're heading toward the hotel and they see on the side of the road a whole herd of sheep and, and stuff. And then they look and they see the shepherd. And the ship or sheep are running from him in front of him. He's driving them along. And they, somebody said, okay, you preach this sermon to us all the time on how sheep were, were you know, never driven, they were drawn. And, then, and the bus driver said, no, 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 that's the butcher. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, that would explain a lot. Yes. <laughs> Sheep follow the shepherd, they run from the butcher. <laughs> so it's like total sense to me. Yes, that's right. Um, and so it is. <laughs> but that's what we have to kind of get at with this. Realizing that sense, like I say, in life, think, just think of the simple example of an acorn. And an acorn, you know, is not, you, you don't create, now we're trying to do that in science with stem cells, yeah. but uh, that's it. Everything is predetermined in the sense of what it shall be by its potential, not by what it was. Mm. You know, you know, it would throw in even a great conversation to what predestination means, therefore. Mm. Um, rather than, well, you, just, you know, you're supposed to go to hell or something like that, rather than, you're supposed to be the image of God. You're each predestined into what you were born to be. And that's, pre you know, will you live out your destiny? Mm. Will the acorn live its destiny? And it will always struggle to do it. Mm. This is actually a nice image, if you'd like, yeah. about spiritual and emotional health. Mm. Because Maybe it's another when thing you actually so realize you see, we're all trying to, to get curve. to where we're supposed to be. That acorn and is trying to get to you know, Maybe it curves and another way. It was and it's all deformed down looking. The redwood forest. And you go, it's well, in trouble. You know, there's there no it is. Thing. It's all deformed. But when it gets up to the sun, you look down and go, yeah, look at all those dark deformations, but I made it to the sun. <laughs> and what we often do is go, look at all my problems. Look at how bad I am off. Rather than, because we determine by our past then. And we say, I'm a mess. Look at all those deformed things because of all the traumas that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, look at all the traumas that happened to you. Keep growing. Keep going. That's why it's a much better term today, which is post-traumatic growth um, <laughs> than post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic disorder. It's post-traumatic yeah. growth. If you will let it grow you, because we, but if you are determined by your past, that's the way it goes. Okay, You're wait. stuck. You're fate. It's a good thing to know if, if one is still caught up in sins of the past. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's forgiveness. Good if, you were, if you were that oak and you've made it above the canopy of the redwoods and you've got the sunlight, you know, you're going to look back and go, look at all that, that crookedness down there. But I'm here. I'm looking at it from success. I mean, that's forgiveness. Mm. That's God's forgiveness. You made it. You made it. Yeah, but look at all the... You made it. Mm -hmm. I do it. Maybe it's another bigger tree. So you see it start to grow and it starts to curve. And then it curves again. And nothing else. Maybe it curves another way. Mm -hmm. And it's all deformed looking. And you go, well, 
you know, there it is, it's all deformed, but when it gets up to the sun, you look down and go, yeah, look at all those deformations, but I made it to the sun. Mm -hmm. And what we often do is go, look at all my problems, look at how bad I am off, mm -hmm. rather than, because we determine by our past then. Mm -hmm. And we say, I'm a mess, look at all those deformed things because of all the traumas that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, look at all the traumas that happened to you. Keep growing, keep going. That's why it's a much better term today, which is post-traumatic growth um, <laughs> than post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic disorder. It's post-traumatic yeah. growth. If you will let it grow you, because we, but if you are determined by your past, that's the way it goes. Okay, You're stuck. You, Your fate. It's a good thing to know if, if one is still caught up in the sins of the past. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's forgiveness. If you, were, if you were that oak and you've made it above the canopy of the redwoods and you've got the sunlight, you know, you're going to look back and go, look at all that, that crookedness down there. But I'm here. I'm looking at it from success. I mean, that's forgiveness. That's God's forgiveness. You made it. You made it. Yeah, but look at all the, you made it. I didn't say you had to have a perfectly straight trunk. I said, get become an oak. Didn't say well, you know anything more than that, you know. And that's why infinite number of times you get forgiven. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Can I be an oak again? Yes. Yeah. Keep coming. <laughs> you know, keep going. Keep going. You know, I don't want to be an oak. I want to be a birch tree. Well, I'm sorry. You're not gonna be. Um, it's <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> and so you can't be a birch. Um, you're an oak. And that's the, the way things go in this sense. Um, and, and so as we hit on this, it's so important about seeing for life. Like I say, often you can take a problem and realize, you know, in the moment, it seems like I've got this problem going on. And it's like the problem is often indicative of, hmm, maybe I'm not going the right direction. If I, and see, unlike oaks, which can grow, we make decisions. And we maybe say, I'd try like to be a birch. Well, I'm sorry, you're not going to make it that way. Or I'm going to turn this way. I'm going to go my own direction. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, keep moving. And it's like that sense. But there's messages. Like depression. You know, there's a lot of different forms of depression. But depression, one, one great message of depression is you're not living your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're in the desert. Of the real desert of, of an unlived life. Find life! You know, oh, okay, find the sun, keep living, move to who you were supposed to be, live out your mm. destiny. Um, and that's why we, uh, again, this is, you know, a lot of imagery, but if, you, if you'd like a proof text, again, I'll, I'll take us back to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, be therefore perfect, says so often, even as your Father in Heaven is perfect, which is complete, completed in the end. It's like, find your, your paraphrase could be, find your destiny and be it. Live your destiny. Be whole. Be complete. And that's, so the, so the word, once again, is that word of destiny. What is the teleos of the acorn? A full-grown, mature oak tree. That's, and so it's, so it's this sense that we're getting at that we're trying to say, we have to choose which philosophy we're going to live by. How does one find one's destiny other than through prayer? Yes, there you go. Mm -hmm. but other than through prayer, that's the biggie. But the other thing is, truly, you know, that's when you're truly trying to say, I'm going to follow God, which is prayer. But take, take, let's take our metaphor of the oak tree. Where is the sun? i got to find the sun. I need the sun. Where is it? I'm in the shadows. Where's the sun? Just keep asking. The oak tree keeps working. It just keeps growing. It doesn't know what it's. It just knows it's growing. Okay, I gotta grow some more. I gotta grow some more. I got ah. Wait a minute. I got a little light. I can turn. You know you. You know so you do that with plants. Possibilities until you keep, something seems to You keep to living. Fit. Now sometimes now, well, this is a d deep subject in that sense because mm -hmm. it is the level of understanding discernment. Mm -hmm. But. I'd say that discernment sometimes is as general as where do you feel life, true life. Not fun, not joy, but fulfillment and life. And that's where I'll go like, 
using the depression again as an example, really you'd see like a, a metaphor of the exodus. Now on the exodus, is a, the exodus itself is a movement like we're looking at in the book of Revelation. It's a movement to new life. And in, and in kind of that census planor again, the deeper meaning of it, the, origin, the surface meaning of the exodus was the Hebrew people went from Egypt to Israel. And this was their journey there. The deeper meaning, you're moving from slavery to the promised land. You're moving from the slavery of this earth and under Satan to the kingdom of heaven. That's the deeper meaning of the Exodus. What happens along it? We wander in circles. Mm -hmm. Because we usually, like the Hebrew people, reject it at first. It's like you get the vision of it first, and it's like, no, you know. And then you're going to wander. And I always, you know, I think it was all like a Celtic knot. You know, they're wandering all over, you know, Sinai and all over the place. And 40 years they wander. And, but how do they know where to wander? They relay. It, how? With the cloud. And what else is the cloud? A pillar of fire. The, pillar of fire. the, fi the cloud is what they see by day because it's this huge pillar of fire. Now what is the, one of the major symbols that fire stands for? Purity. Or purification. Sure. Anything else? Go New Testament on me. The Holy oh, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. They're led by the Spirit of God. They're led by spirit, the Spirit through the desert. It's the Spirit that leads us on this journey from slavery to the promised land. How do we experience mm. the Spirit? How did they experience it? That you're not you're not more alive than you're looking at a pillar of fire going up. Just think of sitting in a big bonfire. Well, multiply that bonfire, and you're going, whoa, this, wow, you know. And what happens when the fire's not there, and let's say you're camping, and the fire goes out? Oh, well, it's kind of dull now. It's time to go to bed, I guess, go to sleep. Um, but it's exciting and warm, and life, life leads you. That sense of life. Just like for a plant, its little rudimentary consciousness is looking for the warmth and the rays of light. And it searches for them. It doesn't have to do it haphazardly. It knows. It kind of moves along. Okay, I get the sense it's there. And so, so it moves. That's why I'll say depression is when you stop following. Mm. You know, and because humans are, are not as, you know, humans have this choice that the other creatures don't have. We make bad choices. The Ibkin doesn't make a bad choice. It just does what it can do. Animals just pick up their discernment and run away from, from floods before, um, before they come. And, you know, and know that. I mean, it's like six months before one of the major floods of South Africa, all the animals went into the mountains, and all the rangers and everybody on the van said, what is going on? What's the man? Why are they going to the mountains during the summer? Six months later, a flood comes, kills most lots of people. The animals are fine. They picked it up way early, got the heck out of there, and uh, because... They picked it up, but we just go, no, it's only a dream. No, 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 that's stupid. Uh, rather than trusting. Now, that's when we start to trust, you know, our deep intuition. And we call deep intuition discernment when we really believe it comes from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Versus comes from me just picking up stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but in this sense, then, we're, we're kind of going, how do we know? We follow life. What really feels alive and fulfilling? And when you do that, rather than what I should do, or what I think others want me to do, or any of these things, mm. it's, is this really life-giving? Mm. And I say, now, the humans, what do we do on that exodus? We're like the people, Dathan and all those other folks, and say, I don't think this is the right way. I know which way to go. I mean, they knew perfectly well where the promised land was back then. Mm -hmm. Because they already been there. Uh, they were turned. They they left because there were giants in the land. They knew. They also knew how to read the stars. That's east. That's west. It's north. So what do we do? We go. It's north. Why am we? This fire is leading us southwest. It's in the wrong direction. Follow life, folks, because otherwise you're head off and you're just in a desert. And what do we call depression so often? A lifeless, waterless desert of life. Where I have no energy and I just might as well lie down and die. It's, that's, and so depression should tell us, I'm in a desert. Where is that pillar of fire? 
Where is that pillar of fire and smoke? Where is that light? Oh, there it is. It's on the horizon. Just a little teeny spark. Head towards it. Head towards that little spark. Even that spark of life that's in us sometimes says, coming. Mm. It's like the person who goes, I know there's a God. You know, but I'm not sure. Go towards it. That's the life call. That's the sense. Okay, if I keep going, and then it gets far, and you get closer, it gets bigger and bigger. So we either get so arrogant that we know which way to go, and that's what most of us do. Uh, we call it theology. Uh, so it's like, you know, uh, and it's like, you know, all 30 some thousand or more. So I say, you know, every denomination has theology. Well, and so and we right. keep splitting. So we've got 30,000 at least. Somebody said 60,000. Um, um, and so, there was, but that's the sense. So we go, okay, we call it that. That's more often, therefore, we have to go with humility. You go, why did my arrogance tell me which way to go? Um, and then the other side of it is, is when we're actually listening like that, you know, what we'll often do is not listen. <laughs> and then, you know, in that sense, begin to just wander aimlessly or say, I know where it's at. This is what happens with, with, with a lot of church, this is what happens a lot of revivals. This is why revivals die. Because revivals, or every great revival has died or turned bad in the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, like the great Relch revival, um, where at the end of it, you know, Jesse Penn Lewis writes this book called War of the Saints, which became all this demonic stuff started happening right after it. We got all the great hymns, God of Grace, God of Glory, you've heard all, all of these things, Reese Howells, all the great people of the Welsh revival, but um, in that sense. But why? Because we're like the people at Sinai. And we go, it happened here. Boy, that flame was here. A couple of years, flames on the mountain, Moses a glowing thing. I mean, this is a happening place. This is the place. Head on out to the new happening charismatic Pentecostal revival. You know, and stuff. And it is, it's great for a while. But then people try and, like Peter, say, let's build a tent here and stay. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jesus has to say, no, it's the Mount of Transfiguration. We're gonna pay, we're gonna move on. And so, but we build that sense. And so the what do we do? We go, this is the great place. And now the people in the fire has moved have moved on and you're looking up at a kind of an old rocky mountain which is burned at the top. And that's <laughs> it. And going, let's do it. You know, and that's, you know, people, you know, singing the same songs again. Even so it was good once, you know, let's just maybe get it, you know, let's, let's get it, you know, maybe if we whip up some energy and emotion for it, and it's like, no, I feel dead, um, and stuff. And that's the sense of going, I've stayed with when the flame moved. I need mm -hmm. to keep moving on. That's how I find my destiny. Now, the, now the, the subtleties and the individuality of that life mm -hmm. that's being led is the is the, the subtle part, mm. you know, the individual part, but the generality is go for destiny that's life, Steve Yeager. Yeah. Um, so, in our dreams, and we're if we're going to mm -hmm. make that effort to pursue our destiny, are they there for self-correcting and or re reinforcing the destiny that we're we're under? Yes. So I mean, they're they're. They're coming up for that purpose, some kind of purpose other than, you know, haphazardly. Right. That's where, that's where actually, um, in a sense, we could say the human spirit, I'm going to put that again here, that's in my instance. It's like, if I actually just arbitrarily put that in again, and here is my ego, I'm going to say, because it's kind of like my identity. But I have, but this... But the human spirit, when it is brought alive by the Holy Spirit, you know, when it is enlivened, or just, I'd actually say, I like to say that, you think of it as a little bit, but the whole thing is the spirit. You know, when that is enlivened by the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden it becomes a life, and we can start getting drawn to it. But there's a process within it that's the real me, that that human spirit is. That says just this is who I'm supposed to be, and I will draw you to me, just like the future oak is drawing the acorn on, if you will. It's a it's a it's a process that's hard to understand because we think the other way around. Mm -hmm. We always think cause and effect from the drive. Mm -hmm. We're reversing that to understand this idea. No, it's from the draw. 
and that's where, I'm, where we're coming at right now with all this, is to get this reversal of understanding to a Christian philosophy that the future draws us. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, the fullness of who I am, that potential of the full circle, is drawing me towards it. Mm -hmm. Just like for the oak tree, that little acorn is being drawn into it. That's the sense. That's supposed to be an acorn down there. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, so, but that sense is like the, that idea of being drawn. And so what the dream is doing, in this case, on an individual basis, is drawing you. And it's, and it tell, it's doing it very, not just kind of like inanimate, like it's a thing. It's like it is a larger, your larger personality. It's, you know, hmm. that sense that it actually, it has intention of doing it. There is a will in that, that's so deep, that's drawing us. And, it's, and that's why I say it's the human spirit being enlivened now by the Holy Spirit. That, that all of a sudden, like the fire, brings you alive from within. And if you start to follow it, you start to actually grow into that true self. Um, we're going to say, because this is a precursor to exactly what we're saying in about a page or so on this writing, this is what we're being moved into in the book of Revelation as the cosmos, mm -hmm. that its true self is about to be found, that it's waiting for it. The creation groans, mm -hmm. waiting for humans to get it together. The creation, what, and so that it too can be glorified. That's the sense. So it can come into its true self as a fullness thereof. And that full self is a glorification itself, which is the new creation, mm. the new heaven and the new earth, just as we are new in the glorified body. Um, that's, that's the move. But the dream is coming from that future self almost. This, this is probably more understood because we got science fiction today, so it's not, it's more, I think it's more easily understood than more maybe a hundred. Yeah. Yes, that I'm going to go, you have a future self, it's time warp type idea. Your future self is coming back <laughs> to you to call you forward. Yeah. Now, if we wrote a, a thing, that is, that's what it is. I would say it's your potential self, but it's that self that God knows you to be in eternity is calling you to it. And when you resist... For all the reasons that we resist, we get ill. Mm. That's the illness of sin, which is sin is that resistance. And, sin, and now sin is not just doing bad things that God doesn't like. Sin is the resistance to God's call. Mm. And we end up being ill. That's the problem. You know, we have these psychological illnesses, physical illnesses, all of this. Um, and that's, you know, the ultimate illness, death. Mm. That's what came with the resistance to God mm. by Adam and Eve. And so we have our smaller ones. And that's why as often you can take them, I guess when I said post traumatic growth a minute ago, we can take what we always take as horrible things and say, really, you know, what can I do with this? What shall I do with this? God never told us to ask why it's happening. He did not say I made you all philosophers to figure out why everything's <laughs> happening. He said... What are you going to do with these events? Mm. And when you figure it out, you're growing. Acorn, what are you going to do when you've got no shade, you know, no light? I, I don't know. I get, I'm kind of stunted. Oh, there's, oh, look, just at this time of day, the light comes through over there for about half hour. And anybody that grows plants knows this. They, it was going to find where the light is. I've got that, if those who've seen it, the old Japanese maple in a pot in the backyard. And, you know, I turn it, you know, about every, you know, six months because it keeps growing one way, you know. It's like, no, I want the whole thing to, you know, so I keep turning it. When it's the other ones that are planted around the place, you know, they're all going this one way. Why? Because when this house we're renting is in, moved into it, it had five redwood trees. That's why mm -hmm. this is not, a, this is a... Example, you know, all five have been cut down because of the terror of the neighbors now that it's going to fall during these storms. <laughs> but, um, but so I've, you know, got the big five stumps. But now the trees can do it. But all those trees that grew up there 
grew up with five redwoods. They were 50 years old. And now, and they all are pointing towards the one place the light would come through. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're pointing that way, but now they can go up and stuff for the first time. That's what the idea is. Keep moving towards that. Um, we'll finish this part of this chapter and then we'll take a brief break. Um, Our intellectual infatuation with classical Darwinian thinking has us believing that everything is determined by past events, in which case we are determined by past fate rather than destiny. We must make a choice which philosophy best fits reality if we are to move out of the confusion in which we live. The Christian message is one that holds forth the image of God as a shepherd. To the agrarian society this image is clearer. The shepherd walked before the flock and the sheep followed behind. The pillar of fire and cloud experienced on the Hebrew Exodus went before them. It did not drive them from behind. These images and more have defined the Judeo-Christian understanding and have been right throughout most of the world's mythologies. They inform us of the most reasonable, if not presently liked, understanding of the motive force of life. Life is defined by destiny. And as I Say one more thing about that. Even the sense of embryology. <laughs> um, guy got put down because it doesn't fit a lot of people's stuff. But a man, um, Burr is his name. I forget his first name. But he was an embryologist at Yale who studied for a long time how life grew into its, into, into its destiny. Because, um, which is what he would take is he took a salamander egg. And he took that salamander egg and, um, and with it, he had the little egg here, and he studied the electrical field around the egg. And originally, the electrical field is around the egg, there. But then he kept measuring it out day by day, and then one day, he's measuring the field, and now the field has become oblong. The egg's still there, but the electrical field is around it. And after a while, that egg grew, the neural cord, and the neural cord grew into the energy field. <coughs> and that's the sense of what happens. He later took a frog and wondered why is it that, um, you, know, you know, frogs and salamanders, why is that salamander, you can cut its leg off and it will grow a new one. Mm -hmm. What happens when the little salamander leg is, is there, you know, the little guy has little legs there. What happens when its, when its leg is cut off? A field grows and the, and the leg will grow into it. Mm -hmm. He took a frog, which that doesn't happen to. Took the frog, cut its leg off. Probably can never get that experiment done today with PETA. Uh, but it's like, you know, but cut the leg off, no leg growing back. Artificially creates a field around it, and the leg grows into the field. It says energy comes first, which is biblically saying the soul comes before the body. Mm. I am formed in the womb before, you know, before my body is known, you knew me. That's on the Night Psalm. Mm. That is the sense of the argument about when does life start. It starts before the physical body. Yeah. It starts at basically the zygote, and right at that moment of life, that in some, you know, of um, pregnancy, basically, mm. life starts as an energy field. You're known in that way, mm. and you'll grow into it. You grow into your destiny. It's become electrical medicine. They haven't figured out how to get this, you know, in such an advanced species as people. You know, they haven't got it beyond a frog. But that's why you have now, a lot of times with broken bones or after surgery, they'll do electrical stimulation on you in order to, to work on things and stuff. But it actually says that we, you know, that this sense of destiny comes first rather than the electrical field forms after Mm. The, the neural cord. Now it's there. No, it came prior to it. Um, mm. Mm. Um, it it's a book called um, Blueprint, Blueprint for Immortality by, um, I always want to say Raymond Burr because of, you know, Perry Mason, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, somebody else, Burr. Finishing this chapter, or this part. The destiny that is portrayed in John's dream is one of union, consummation, and wholeness. It is of entry into a life beyond division, where earth and heaven are not divided, where human beings and God are no longer separate, but are so close 
that it would take the very sword of the Spirit to divide between them as between bone and marrow. Now let us take a deeper look at just what this destiny entails. Mm. Okay, we'll have a brief uh, five-minute break for tea and my bathroom and stuff. We'll move on to the consummation. It sounds good. It does. <laughs> She's coming, right? It is now. It's empty. Oh, empty. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't that was another three part. Like like so now we move on to page seven, which is essentially is in, you know, subtitled there, The Consummation. The resolution of John's vision begins. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. That's Revelation 21.1. This is what is recorded in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. Immediately we are led to understand that the consummation of the vision reveals that the present life is not to be reconstructed, nor is it some form of reordering of present attitudes. John presents a complete transformation a totally new form of life and existence. It is to be understood that the old will be completely removed in favor of a transformed life. Mm. It will be a life that no longer experiences separation from God or separation of any mm. form. Since separation is the origin of pain and sorrow, these too will have no place in the transformed life. John observed that this as he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. This transformation would mean union with God, a thing the great saints and mystics have always held as the culmination of life, the destiny of the soul. Hmm. Makes me wonder what the old life was for. Ah, that's a good thing yeah. to hold on to. Um, <laughs> in the sense, the old life, or, you know, in the sense of really this idea is. When we take it, we're at this point, when we go back, uh, you know, again, the commercial for the middle of the book, mm -hmm. we're at the very end, um, <coughs> is the sense of the old life wasn't supposed to be. Okay. It's not, we a, fell. Preparation, not a preparation, but it wasn't supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be. This is essentially a return to what was supposed to happen in the garden. Mm -hmm. So there's a forgiveness involved. Yeah. I mean, this is, when you think about what the Garden of Eden was like prior to the fall, <laughs> then it's like, then what we see is we become, we, that's why I've heard me say this, we have devolved. Mm, yeah. We have devolved down to almost just being barely above the chimps and the dolphins right now. Mm -hmm. So everybody thinks dolphins and chimps are so bright. So we have become so stupid. Um, that's it. Seriously, I mean, that's it. We, we were supposed to be in these glorified places, the, the metaphorical gardeners of this glorified place. There was a glory and a light upon us. Mm -hmm. That that light that we were, that we shall be, that's our potential, and that was, was we moved at the fall. Mm -hmm. We were clothed with light, the light of God, and then we ate of the tree, and what happens? You become naked. The clothing leaves you. You know, what, when they said, we're naked, who told you you're naked? You know, what do you mean? They were already naked. They weren't wearing clothes. And all of a sudden they got naked, they just realized they were naked. And that sense is the light of God that we shall be in was removed. And then we put in this whole process is how to get back to our destiny that we are where to be. And so what's this middle life for? It's like it wasn't supposed to be here in that sense. Um, and that it's the process of trying to get back to it. Sorry, you want to? Yeah, so I think that the in our fallen state, do we even know, in our 
without the help of the spirit, Holy Spirit, what, what, what natural normal even means. <laughs> right. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> so, yes. So, another important thing is you get hold of this, it starts to help you from this vision to actually assess different forms of belief, too. Like, if it's like this, are, are we trying to transform the world into the kingdom of heaven? Mm. How many, there's a lot of times that's happening. We're trying to say that, you know, like even the idea of blessings. You know, there's a whole move where you, the more wealth you have, the more blessed you are. Which would say that that is, the more you're Christian, the more you're going to have glory in this world. Mm. And that's, but this world is not it, Jesus says. Mm. Matter of fact, it's not actually re-blessing this creation, in a sense. This creation changes, and the, 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 the proof of the pudding then comes in those places of the glorified body. That would say that there's a way we should never die, but all of us die. Why? Because this body is to be transformed. As Paul puts it, it's planted a seed and grows into, well, I'm not sure what, he says, he, but it's like this sense that it's a glorified body. You know, it's, trans, it's, it's planted, mortal, rises, immortal. That's Paul in that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians and all. That we're going, this is it. So the, the theologies today which say we're supposed to rule this earth, you know, that type of thing, and turn this into a Christian earth, really kind of go, okay, you know, I'd like to see better morals and stuff like that, but the idea of ruling it, we're never promised. Matter of fact, we're promised from this that things get really bad mm -hmm. and uh, worldly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we basically, you know, are seeing that what we've got is a new transformed one rather than just a <coughs> reconstituted creation and a reconstituted life. Um, it'll have a lot to say if you hold on to that and a lot of things come up for you, you know, um, you know then all of a sudden... You know, this, this is a touchstone of what the purpose is. The purpose is moving into this transformed life, um, which is, you know, even what the spiritual life is all about. How do I transform and begin that transformation even now? Mm -hmm. uh, which is what this book is about um, in a great way. Um, but it's that sense of holding on to the consummation that way that throw, goes on the face of, I say, a lot of what would be called worldly Christianities today that are trying to just redeem this world and make this, you know, that way. At this point, John has shown that this transformed life is one that we merely participate in. We do not create. Mm. He understands this when he hears the voice of God proclaim himself as the originator and author of the process. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he heard, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. In this process that is entered into, not one, not one, this, it is a process that is entered into, not one that is accomplished by one's own creative powers, nor purchased through some atoning acts. It is new life given without payment. That should mess you up a little bit, so we'll get to it. Because <laughs> um, that's all humans do, isn't it? Try to attain God. This is why we some say, it's nothing you can do, you know, to get God, all you have to do is actually accept what's already happened. Mm -hmm. It's already happened. Can you believe it? And we, in our arrogance of wanting self-control, that's one of the biggest and hardest things to believe. That it's already done. And God did it. Mm. Um, no, I've got to meditate for ten years on a, you know, in a cave on top <laughs> of a mountain. And then maybe God will allow me to do it. You know, that type of thing. Maybe if I do all of these good works, God will appreciate me enough and I can, he'll let me in the kingdom of heaven. And it's always this sense of, it's already done. It's I have made all things new. I am doing it. Will you join me, mm. is all God says. 
um, not what do you need to do to make it happen. Um, mm. Knowing that makes things a lot different. This does not mean, if you wanted to get lazy right now, this does not mean, however, that it is attained passively. A person must actively participate to gain this newly transformed existence. John tells us that what he now understood was that the one who conquers will have this heritage, and it will be his God, and he, I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But I've got a question here. Yes? Everyone, I think, probably on this planet has lied. It's the same as saying, you know, you know, I have murdered, but I am a mur am I a murderer? Do I identify as a murderer? No. You know, that's the idea. Or a liar. Are you identified as a liar? I am a liar. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that um, <laughs> actually almost do identify that way. They find lying um, an acceptable way of living. Mm -hmm. And that's the sense. Do you, you, you may have lied, but do you think lying is right? I'll ask you that, Cheryl. Do you, know, <laughs> do you think lying is correct, the correct way to live? You embrace no, it's lying. something to be avoided, but I sometimes succumb. There you go. Well, that's a different thing. Then you go, oh, Lord, I did it again. Yeah. And I'll probably do it again, but please help me. You know, um, I know this is wrong, and I don't want to keep doing it. That's confession. Mm -hmm. That's the sense. Mm -hmm. But it's the person who says, you know something? God, you got to put up with this. This is the way I am. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like murderers. Um, that's why I talk about classical Darwinianism. Versus, you know, there's modern things. But classical was one of the most famous cases that Clarence Darrow ever thing. And it was, you know, he's known for the Scopes, Scopes, yeah, Scopes, Scopes trial. trial, which is, you know, that type of thing. But his first case was for two boys who um, um, were, in, I think, in Chicago. And they went out and killed somebody. And their defense by Clarence Darrow was, is that's evolution. <laughs> Um, we are. To, we, this is what I was inherited. This was my fate. I am a murderer, and this is. And I don't. It's not my fault. It's what I inherited in my genes. He defended the case according to that thing. That's why they called him into the Scopes trial. I think it was you know that followed it. I believe. I don't think it was the other way around and stuff. That sense. And that's saying I am a murderer. But hey, just the way I am, you know. Rather than, I am a murderer, and I need to stop being a murderer. And I don't know how to do it. Well, Help. this passage doesn't really qualify things that way, though the rest of the New Testament does. Well, that's where you need context. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, where if we just said this. But it's not saying everybody that's lied, and, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and all liars. Well, yeah, <laughs> but, it's, but it's all liars, but it's not everybody that lied. It's, yeah. it's like saying the difference between guilt and shame. Mm. Guilt's great, shame is not. Mm -hmm. Shame is, this is what I am. I am a sinner. No, I sin and I'd like to stop. You know, versus, it's all, oh, I'm just, I'm horrible, look what I did, this is who I am. <laughs> it's the difference between being and doing. And doing, God says, I, this is not who you are. What do you mean? There are, it's people that identify as liars. Versus, I lie, I need to, to deal with that. Now, how do you deal with it? We're getting there. We're at the end, but we'll go back to the beginning. Because personally, the book of Revelation is teaching you how to deal with this stuff. Corporately, it's teaching us as a, as a, as a race, a human race, how to deal with this stuff. You know, but it starts individually once again. So I'm going to go, liars are those people that know... That, you know, I mean, unfortunately, a bunch of our politicians fit into this. <laughs> um, they believe it's okay, you know... To say what they think a particular group wants to hear. Right. Lying is it, fine. It works. It, well, that's it. You say what you need to say to get what you want. See, if you actually say that, that this is a different philosophy that a lot of them do live by, quite literally, which is 
the ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. Right, because the idea is you get these people to vote for me, put me in office, then I'll do good things for them. Or yeah, or but they don't understand. People don't understand because they're pretty stupid sheep. And so therefore, I know better, and I'm just going to tell them this, but I'm going to do this because it's good for them. But it's like, because the end's going to be good. And it's like the, um, it's like Stalinist Russia or Soviet Union. You know, we want to distribute the wealth, and so let's kill all the farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's all right to kill them all, as they did. They killed tens of thousands of farmers because they owned the, the farmers owned the land. Mm -hmm. So Stalin had them killed to give the land to the people. Now that's the end. So the 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 means, you know, you know, the end is just uh, the the ends justify the means. Killing all those people is 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 necessary in order to get to this end of a redistribution of the land. Unfortunately, everybody knew how to how to farm was dead, so they starved. <laughs> uh, but it's I mean that was un that was a sense. But it can be very hard to be a leader. Well, in, in this world, it would make you not well, want to be a leader. Well, in this world, but that's when you have to go, the ends never justify the means. Mm -hmm. but again, the means create the end, mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. If, you know, that's the sense, you know, that's why we'd say, you cannot create good from evil. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and so, so if you're going to do evil, it will become evil. Isn't mm -hmm. that what, pe why people hate the Old Testament, though? Because it seems like uh, God was justifying the means, you know, like the doing end. evil things to justify his grand plan. Yeah, you know that's a good I mean? point. I mean, like, you know, so, why... So, I mean, how do you explain all that? Yeah. <laughs> that's another... All of it in one night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that that's what came well, to mind. So. No, it's a good, it's no, a good point. Because, you know, yeah. but isn't that the sense saying, you know, I've got to get rid of these people? Um, or is it... You know, something more in there that's probably, you know, like you say, a depth thing. But there's two type of things. Is the idea of, I want all these Jewish people to have this land, therefore you guys are all dead. Or is it that you won't listen? And so, and therefore the lake of fire starts early, you know, for a non-listener in that mm -hmm. idea. There would be two types of, and so if we actually said, wait a minute, now we're going to get the mind of God being more that the ends do not justify the means. But, but, but then we kind of go, or, and then he also says, I'm not just a Mr. Nice Guy. There are some people, you know, that just don't get it. Um, and they're not going to get it. They're intentionally not getting it. And if they intentionally not get it, I have to basically say bye-bye. I mean, one of my favorite scriptures of recent history is Jesus and the rich young ruler. Because it, because there's so many codependent people, especially codependent Christians that are around. And, um... <laughs> And then, and then there's the two other ones, which are the Christians that think you've got to save everybody. <laughs> which is, yeah, it'd be nice, but the you've got to save everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, uh, is in there. <clears throat> and so the rich young ruler is the one I think is the best one, which is Jesus comes up, and the guy comes up to him and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Mm -hmm. And already Jesus is not codependent because he's going, well, you know, almost like, you know, to do the law. Um, you know, that's yeah. what he says. And the guy goes, I've done all that. And then Jesus turns to him, you can just see just his heart, he says he has compassion. His heart melts. Um, and he goes, he loves him. And he goes, you're right, you're very close. All you need now is to go sell all you have and follow me. Which is a great answer saying, you want the eternal life, you want the kingdom of heaven, I'm it. Come on, you've got it. All you have to do is walk with me. It's not like do this good task and, you know, we always say, well, sell everything, you know, and then you'll be, you know, be poor and you'll have God. No, I'm him. If you, but, she, but I'm wandering. So you can't be sitting at home and wandering with me at the same time. Go, sell it, come along. You're one of my disciples. And the guy walks away. And what does Jesus do? Absolutely nothing. I said, good evangelicals. John, James, yes, after him now. Make sure he gets it. He's a prospect, you know. You know, that's it. and he really wants it. Don't lose him, you know. Uh, and that's it. No, it's like, wow. And I see, I always hear a really sad tone in Jesus' voice saying this. So it's a sad thing, but it's like easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's move on, boys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and off they walk. Which means there are people that won't get it. 
They just won't get it. They're intentionally not getting it. They will not change, at which point you have to let them go. You know, we see this all around us. You just have to let them go. I mean, I've told some of you know this, I mean, I'll put it now as 40 years ago, because I'm getting that much older. Uh, but it's like, I remember reading, actually I was reading this um, in, in a psychology class with uh, Jung, Carl Jung book. And in it he says, you know, that there's just some people he, he can't help. And I have in my, I, that is so ridiculous. This guy has no faith, that's why. You know, he had no faith. So, of course, you can, God can save everybody. What does he mean there's some people you can't help? Forty years later, well, there are just some people you can't help. <laughs> they don't want help. They're just not going to be helped. They're not going to be healed. They're not going to be saved. It's just the way it is. Mm. Now, in my early 20s, that was not right. Mm. You know, but I've met enough of them. Um, you know, that just, you know, that sense. Um, that you go, no, no. Um, and it's like, I was um, telling me, a while back, I remember <laughs> that um, that um, there was a guy in San Anselmo, a man, a homeless man there, who is from a very wealthy ha family, who will not be helped. His brother is a top-notch lawyer, and he brings him a down jacket every every fall for the winter. But he lives in the creek, and, um, and he comes up and he gets um when the Coco's uh, Pizzeria Eater was there, it's now something else, he'd come up and get a pizza there, go to the roasters, get his pot of coffee, everybody knew him, and then he'd go back down underneath the building and sleep in the creek. And that was nice. And his brother tried to get him out. Everybody was like, you know, and stuff like this. It's like, going, this man does not want to be helped. He's happy with his life. And so, you know, now that's not about salvation with him. That was just saying, you know, you know, these type of things go on. So... So that's what I'm going to go. There are certain now, that's people, which we're not going to talk about God's judgment on them, but people who go, I like killing people. I mean, really, just think of these people, these cartel members. Mm -hmm. They like killing people. I mean, you want to be sick stuff. I mean, I'm just listening to a snippet that I won't probably watch anything more of, but Laura Logan, who is, uh, you know, this, this um, journalist, who I don't know if you remember her, but she was one who was, you know, actually beaten up and raped in Egypt during one of the things and stuff and she's gone through hell in a handbasket you know of all the stuff she's gone through she has been investigating the cartels and they got her into some of the towns and she was talking about how they enjoy and they've learned like worst old tribes how to actually torture you and that they made you become a torso. They learned how to cut don't off all go, your limbs. Don't go into too much detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they, me. Uh, yeah. But, but, I dream about those. Yeah, things. well, that's it. They learned to do this stuff <laughs> and learned to, and how to, and her question was, well, I'll say any more. How do they keep them, they've learned how to keep somebody alive for a week that way. And I'm going, these people do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. These are murderers. Yeah. This right. is what it means. Uh, this is who I am. This is what I do. This rather is where than, they get their rather than their I was in a self-defense mode and I shot somebody and killed them, that's the person that feels guilt for a long time. But that guilt says, "You're not going to the lake of fire. Just say, God help me." But the person goes, "It's my job. I kill people." Uh, there's a bunch of those out there. We call, you know, a lot of the gang members are that way. Would ISIS put in that? A lot of people in that. Yeah, you know, it's that type of thing. Then we can throw other stuff in there, too. But that idea of when we say, you know, when you identify with these things. Um, the sexually immoral, we say that. It's like, you know, you know, hey, God just has to put up with this. It's, it's the new morals. Get with it, God. Um, that type of thing. You know, it's like, that's the type of thing we see much more blatant than murderers and yeah. liars. You know, that one is just clear to us. You need to accept my lifestyle, and that's just the way it is. And it's like, no, that's not the lifestyle I put out that God said in the Bible. He says, this is a, there's a lifestyle I put out. Are you going to accept it? No. You know, because you're unfair, God. Um, and that's, you know, you know, you made me like this, so... Um, and that's, I mean, really, people have done that. Um, and so we go, that's identity with it versus behaviors. Um, <laughs> We'll just finish this section and, and then stop for the night. Um, only now do we begin to gain experience of just what that union with God, that transformed life, will appear to be. Because then he says, 
Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It is intriguing to realize that unlike some seeming absorption into cosmic consciousness, John is allowed to retain a self-identity. It is not that the ego is to be dissolved in this process, but rather that it will take on its rightful position as the conscious observer of the transformation of the complete self and the transformation of creation. The ego has often usurped its given role and attempted to be the center mm -hmm. of its own created cosmos. Since this was a false position, and since the true position of a greater self, of an image of God or Imago Dei, must be attained as our true salvation and destiny, then the ego must be dealt with before health could be found. When the ego took over the unwarranted role of the center of the self, a natural reaction occurred, allowing the only alternative was that it must be destroyed so that health and wholeness, the destiny of the psyche, to be in the image and likeness of God could be manifested. We observe such moves towards destroying the ego both in natural religion and in psychosis. Mm -hmm. Natural religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, which are based on millennia of thoughtful observation more than on perceived revelation, mm -hmm. recognize the ego's arrogant error and took on the position that the ego must be essentially destroyed mm -hmm. to make way for the true self. Mm -hmm. The rituals and doctrines then put forth formed a boundary to protect the individual along the path of self-denial. Mm -hmm. However, the concept of egolessness was still merely an ultimately neurotic resolution to mm -hmm. the former aggrandizement of the personal identity. As a debasement of who we are, it was merely the opposite impulse of aggrandizement, and as such still was one-sided and avoided wholeness. Mm -hmm. For the individual who did not have a religious system to grasp hold of and protect him, this same disillusion of the ego was what would occur in psychosis, as the greater self needed to deal with the upstart ego. In this case, it was not a neurotic one-sidedness that was experienced, but a loss of rationality and reason. The loss of self described in naturalistic religion and in psychosis is not the answer. The loss of an ego-identified sense of self described by John, is one in which the ego stands back as conscious observer and, as such, participates in the work of transformation. The ego is strong and present, but it is humbly submissive and takes its rightful place in who we are as images of God, our destiny. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you can somewhat see that the ego usurped its position at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. It became the center mm -hmm. at that moment when it wasn't supposed to be. We're trying to return back to where it was. Mm -hmm. So humbly accepting our goal is to be what God wants us to be. Yes. With his help. Yes. And not try to avoid that responsibility. Right. Or that role. Yes. Or to be somebody else that we're not. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great messages mm -hmm. of the really well-meaning Christian and many others with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mm -hmm. That was her destiny. Yeah. Very, very few people could do that. And people wanted to be Mother Teresa and they flew mm -hmm. over to Calcutta to be with her and she'd look at them and go, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> this is not your destiny. And they could handle like a week or two. And they go, I'm out of here. <laughs> exactly. This isn't who God called you to be. Mm -hmm. We're not, we all have a different destiny, mm -hmm. you know, a different call, a different sense of who God sees us as. And we need to be it, is what mm -hmm. the answer is. And, uh, and how to find that, how to be that, that's what we move on to. Um, we're going to move into that next week because we just read the end of the story. And so we'll start with the beginning of the story next week.
we go to the beginning of the book of Revelation in that sense and start to move through it to see the process of that humbling of the ego, if you will, it dealing with its all of its stuff in order to become that image of God and how then as humans we actually relate that to this world as it goes through the same process. So with that, good night. <laughs>